baby on the deals, Nick. So, real quick, two quick announcements. Uh, I, I want to discuss administrative things. Uh, the first is that everyone should be aware that, that homework one is due next week on Monday at midnight. Some of you have already started. Uh, people that were trying to get enrolled in the course, they've already finished, obviously. Actually, whoever got it first, I don't know who it is yet, they weren't even, they weren't even on the wait list. They were already enrolled in the course, and they beat all of you, right? So whoever, whoever that was, uh, congrats. Um, and then the, the other thing also is next week, we will be releasing the first programming project. Um, so that'll be, I think it'll be due in two weeks after this. So I'll send out a, a notice about this, but we've adjusted the deadline slightly for these projects because last year the feedback we got was the first project was considered too easy and the second project was considered really hard. So everyone thought the, first, the second project would be like the first project. And so a lot of people end up failing because they didn't allot themselves enough time. So we're giving you less time for project one, more time on project two, okay? The other thing to announce is also there's a bunch of database uh, talks coming up in, in the next week. Um, so tomorrow uh, in CIC on the fourth floor, we're we'll having the, the co-founders of Kinetica, which is a GPU accelerated database system out of Virginia. They'll be coming giving a talk at noon. Again, that's open to everyone. You don't have to you register for this. And there will be pizza available for that, for that one. Um, and then on Friday, we'll have a talk from Pat Helen from Salesforce. Uh, Pat is a sort of a, somewhat of a, a legend in the database research community. Um, he's not an academic, he's just sort of somebody that's been around working on databases for a long time since the 1980s. So uh, he's going to come give a talk also at noon in the CIC 44. There should be pizza this one as well. Um, so I encourage you to come to either one of those. So the first one, the Connecticut talk, would be very technical. Right? They're going to talk about more about the engineering side of, of making database systems run on GPUs. And this is going well beyond anything we'll talk about in this course. And then the Salesforce talk should be a bit more lofty, a bit more higher level, right? Because Pat's much more senior. It's about you know, thinking big about distributed systems, distributed databases. And then on Wednesday next week uh, at 4 p.m., we'll be having the co-founder of Relational AI come give a talk. So I don't know this person. This is actually being organized by somebody else in Tepper. Um, but the, the co-founder of Relational AI had a previous database system startup called Logic Blocks which is a bit of an esoteric system. It doesn't look like, didn't operate the same way that the database systems that we're talking about here operate. Um, but so he's sort of a semi-famous guy, so he'll also be giving a talk at, at 4 p.m. So the first one will be on YouTube. The other two will not be, okay? So the first two will have pizza. The second one, I don't know, because I'm not, I'm not running it. You can plan your meals accordingly. All right, any questions? Any questions about homework one? Okay, let's jump right into it. Okay, so where we're at now is that we spent the first two lectures talking about sort of higher level things, like how what, what the relational model is and how you would write queries against data stored, stored like that. Um, and that was all sort of lofty in, in terms of or high level and abstract, right? We didn't describe anything about how we actually would implement code that could do the, the, those particular things. So at this point in the course, this is where we sort of start jump into now describing how you would actually build software to execute queries on a relational database system. And so that's really what the next, pretty much from now until Thanksgiving, uh, the things that we're going to be talking about. And so if you go back to the course outline that I showed at the first class, right, we sort of already covered the first part. We already covered relational databases. And now we're getting into all the implementation details. And so the way to sort of think about this as we're going to going along at a high level is that we're essentially going to be describing different layers of the database management system software that we're going to build on top of to do more complicated things or get more functionality out of it, right? So at the storage level, we're sort of starting at the bottom, right? We're talking about how we're actually going to read and write data and what that data looks like on disk. And then we define an API in our disk manager or our storage manager to say, here's how to interact with the data that I can manage. And then on top of that, we can then build our buffer pool. Then on top of that, we can start building our execution engines or access methods. Right? So, so we're going up by one by one and to describe how you would build uh, each different layer. What are the trade-offs? What are the different design decisions you have to uh, think about for each layer? And then once that's sort of done, we can assume that we're good to go. Right? As long as we implement whatever that layer wants, or we define what our API is, we can build other stuff on top of that. So we'll see in a couple of cases today where I'm going to describe different ways to 
organize pages or organize data in pages. And what happens above that actually doesn't matter in some ways, right? We can still use maybe the same concurrent control schemes or the same indexing schemes on top of this because we have this sort of abstraction down below. And this is, this is not new to databases or not unique to databases. This is the standard practice in building any large uh, software system. So again, so today's class and next class, uh, we're focusing on the disk manager. And again, this is just how we're going to actually store data on disk. So for the, the, the course, I sort of mentioned this in the beginning, but I didn't really define what I meant. Um, so I want to say that this course is focused on what I would call a disk-oriented database management system architecture. And so what I mean by that is that the database management system is designed such that it, assumes, that it assumes the primary storage location of the database is on some non-volatile disk. And I'll define what I mean by non-volatile disk in the next slide. And therefore, the, the components of the system are responsible for figuring out how to move data back and forth between the non-volatile disk and, and volatile memory. Right, because you can't operate, the database system can't operate data directly on disk, right? There are some newer disks that can do these kind of things because there's CPUs down there. But in practice, like a commodity disk you would buy on Amazon or Newegg, right? You're not gonna be able to write, run code down on there, right? So you always have to bring the data you need to operate on to either read and write into memory and then do whatever it is that you need to do. So the database management system is all about managing th that movement back and forth at this level of, of the architecture. And, and this, is, this is the classic von Neumann architecture from, from the 1950s. So in order to understand the implications of this movement of data back and forth, uh, we first want to understand what the storage hierarchy looks like. What are we actually dealing with in, in our real systems? So the, the, the way to sort of think about it is, is this, this sort of tree structure like this. right? And the, every single layer is a different kind of storage class device. And the, you can only move data directly from one layer to another. right? Um, you can only take data out from, well, that's not exactly true, but you can only take data out from an SSD and put it into DRAM before you can put it into your CPU caches, right? Again, that's not entirely true. In most cases, but for our purposes, let's just go with that. So the way to sort of think about this is, in, in this hierarchy, is the storage devices at the top are really fast, uh, but they have much smaller capacity, and they're also much more expensive, right? And at the bottom, you have larger storage devices that have larger capacities that are cheaper per gigabyte or per megabyte, um, but they're going to be much, much slower. So if you go look in the, in the textbook, they'll describe sort of this hierarchy as well. The one thing I'll point out is they don't put network storage at the bottom. Network, store, network storage would be something like EBS or HDFS, like a just distributed file system. Below this would be like tape archives. Right? I mean, that's really only used for the disaster recovery. You can get that from Amazon. Amazon has a thing called Amazon Glacier. Right, that's like super, super slow. We're not even, even going to worry about that here. So the, for in our course, the way we're going to sort of differentiate between these different layers is not so much between SSDs and, and HDDs. It's really, is it volatile or versus non-volatile? So anything above the line is considered volatile. Right? That means like you, if you remove power on the machine, like you pull the power cord, and then every, all your data is gone. Right? DRAM needs power every so often in order to refresh its cells and, and maintain the charge. Same thing for CPU caches and CPU registers. And so the, 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 the way we're going to access the volatile data is going to be different than how we're going to access it in non-volatile data. So in volatile data, it's going to support what's called a random access API, meaning we can jump to any single uh, byte address and get the actual data that's there. Um, and it's going to be able to support this fast random access. Right? We can jump around anywhere in, in, in our memory uh, space, and it's going to be roughly the same speed no matter where we go. Non-volatile memory is going to be better off for doing what's called sequential access. So that's trying to read uh, a lot of data that's sort of contiguous to each other in, in storage. Right? So you just sort of read all, all the data at once. You can still jump around, but it's going to be slower. And instead of accessing a single uh, address, address line or cache line to go get the data we need, uh, we're going to access the data in what are called blocks or pages, which are typically about four kilobytes. Right? So in volatile storage, I can say, go get me this sing single 64-bit memory location, and I want to read the value. In a non-volatile storage that's, that's block addressable, I have to go get the four kilobyte block that has the data I need, and then inside of that, I can get the 64-bit uh, value that I want. Right? So the... Again, the way to sort of think about this is that when, when I talk throughout the course, 
I'm not going to differentiate between SSDs and HDDs or network storage. I'm really going to say that anything above uh, SSD that's memory, uh, or sorry, DRAM that will be considered memory, uh, and then anything below that will be just considered disk, right? Because at, at a high level, the algorithms we're going to use to accessing what I'll call disk are roughly the same, whether it's an SSD, HDD, or, or EBS. So the other thing I'll also say, too, is in this course, we're not going to care about anything above DRAM, right? So CPU caches like L1, L2, L3, uh, or anything like CPU registers. Because in our world with, it, with a disk, the disk is so slow that all of our focus is really about how can we speed up or hide the, the latency of these storage devices down here. And you know, once it's in memory, that's good enough. So if you take the advanced class in, in the spring, 15721, we're not going to do disk-oriented database systems. We're going to actually do memory-oriented or in-memory database systems. So this now the disk goes away, except for logging. And now, since everything's in memory, now we care about the stuff at the top. right? And you can actually get pretty good speed up if you start aligning things to, 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 to cache lines or try to maintain as much data in, in CPU registers, actual individual registers, for as long as possible. But again, for our purpose here, we, we don't care. The other thing I want to bring up, too, is also there is actually a new storage technology uh, that, that's coming out called non-volatile memory that sort of sits in, in, the, in the middle here, right, between SSDs and, and DRAM, right? So this is sometimes called persistent memory or storage class memory. The way to sort of think about it is it's like DRAM in that it's fast, supports random access, and things are byte addressable, but it's persistent like an SSD, right? So meaning if I, if I write to non-volatile memory and I pull the plug, all my data is still there when I come back. So the last couple of years, as I, I've been teaching this course, I always keep saying, like, oh, yeah, non-volatile memory, it exists in the labs. You actually can't get it yet, so we're not really going to worry about it here. Uh, that's actually not true as of this year. So Intel announced that they have actually non-volatile memory in production. Uh, we actually have access, access to it here at, at CMU. My PhD student uh, that just graduated, he's now at Georgia Tech, he, his whole thesis was on non-volatile memory databases. So we're not ready yet to throw away the entire textbook. But I think a lot of the things that we'll talk about during the semester, some of these things will go away, some of these things will be, get tweaked, because now you're going to have non-volatile memory. So I think Intel is announcing it's going to come out in, uh, later, later this year, supposedly. Um, I think they're, they're calling it uh, 3D crosspoint or Optane memory. There's a bunch of different marketing terms for it. But again, but the high level, it works like this. It looks like DRAM, but it's persistent like an SSD. All right, so to give an idea of why we're going to spend a lot of work to uh, move data back and forth between DRAM and disk, we have to understand what it takes to actually get data out of disk and bring it into memory. So there's a bunch of different tables on the internet that roughly have the same information sort of like this. So the exact numbers might be slightly different, but the, the, the magnitude of the differences are, are, are roughly the same. So to read data from a single cache line, or an L1, which is the, the closest cache you can have to below, or right above the CPU registers, it takes about half a nanosecond. If you've got to read from L2, it's seven nanoseconds. DRAM is 100 nanoseconds, and so forth and so forth, right? So when you show numbers like this with nanoseconds, people don't really know how to like, put that in perspective of like, real-world clock time. So instead of saying that maybe for this case here, that L1 cache reference takes half a nanosecond, what would we say if it takes a second? Right? Now you can actually see why reading from these, these slower devices is so bad, right? So if we say L1 cache is a, cache miss is a, is a, is a second, half a second, then reading from uh, L2 cache is seven seconds, DRAM is 100 seconds, reading from an SSD is 1.7 days, reading from a spinning disk magnetic hard drive is 16 weeks, reading from network storage like EBS is 11 months, and then reading from a tape drive is 31 years. The other uh, sort of metaphor people like to use is, say I want to read a book, I want, I want to read, read a page in a book, right? Reading from my CPU caches is like the book is right in front of me. Reading it from maybe DRAM is like walking across the room to get it. Uh, reading from SSD is like walking down to the library and getting it. But like reading it from a tape drive is like flying to Pluto to read the book and then flying back, right? right so th these are orders of magnitude slower. And again, this is why we're going to be taught to be smart about how we keep our data in DRAM as much as possible. Uh, to avoid ever having to go to disk. Now, in some cases, we can't avoid this, right? We have to actually write data to disk to make sure things are durable, but we can be smart about how we actually want to do this. So our system design goals for actually how we're going to build a database system is 
at a high level, what we essentially want to do is we want to have the provide a, a software system that has the illusion that the entire database fits in DRAM, even though it doesn't, right? And we're going to be careful about how we move data back and forth, and we want to do it in such a way that we avoid large stalls because we have to go fetch something from disk, um, and we don't want to have, have that slow down everything else. Again, it's unavoidable. If the data is not in memory, you've got to go get a disk and get it. But ideally, you want to have the data system be able to do other things uh, while you're going fetching that, that data, like maybe uh, processing other queries. And of course, now we'll see this later on when we talk about transactions and concurrency control. But if you have multiple threads doing multiple things at the same time, because maybe one thread stalled to go out the disk, now you make sure that you order their operations correctly uh, so they don't you know, read data that they shouldn't be reading. Okay, we'll worry about that later for our purpose here. We're just trying to see how, how can we deal with reading, writing data from disk and how we're going to organize things. So the, I mentioned this before when we talked about the, the difference between non-volatile and volatile memory, but just to bring it up again. Um, the big also difference we're going to see is and how we design these components is dealing with the fact that sequential access on non-volatile storage is much faster than random access. So that means that we're going to try to maximize our ability to read and write data sequentially, meaning reading large blocks of data uh, at a time to get things that we need. Right? If you have to go jump around, say if you have a spinning disk hard drive and it has a mechanical arm that jumps around on the platter, right? if you have to jump it around for every single time you want to read a single tuple, then that's going to be uh, really slow. But if you can read, you know, plop the arm down and let it read a large segment of data, then bring that in memory, then that's going to be much faster. Because again, there's, there's, there's fewer, fewer movements of, of the physical arm. So the operating systems usually support the ability to allocate multiple pages or blocks in, in a row. Right? These are called as extents. Right? So you can say, I want to allocate one megabyte extent or one gigabyte extent, and then the OS will try to align those together or make them be contiguous in the, on the actual storage device itself. So as I said, like in my design goals, we try to want to make, we want to have our database system provide the illusion that it has more memory than it actually has, right? If, if we have one gigabyte of RAM and we have a 10 gigabyte of database, we want to make it appear that the entire database fits in, fits in memory. So what does that sound like? Who here has taken an operating system course? What's that? I heard it. Virtual memory, exactly, right. So this is essentially what virtual memory does, right? Virtual memory, the operating system says, all right, here's my address space, but then I have this little swap section where I can write out pages when I run out of a space in memory. And it looks to the, the application, it looks like everything is actually in memory when it's not. Right? You don't have to write, change your code in any way to deal with the fact that the page you want to read is out on disk. The operating system hides all that for you. So you now you're saying, well, if, I, if this is what I want in my database system, I want the ability to have it appear that I have more memory than I actually have, and the operating system already can do this in virtual memory, why not just use the operating system for this? So the way you would actually write this is uh, through a syscall called MMAP. Who here has heard of MMAP? Two in the back. OK, three. All right, so MMAP means memory map file. And the beta, way to basically think about this is like you have a file on disk, and you tell the operating system, you MMAP it, you load it in, and it's basically going to map the, the physical pages of the, of, of the file on disk into virtual memory addresses in, in, inside of you know, the OS. And then from your application standpoint, you can jump to any location in that file in, in, in your memory address. And underneath the covers, the operating system will page things in and out as needed. Right? So the, the operating system is essentially responsible for moving data in and out. So just to give a quick example, it looks like this. Say this is our, this is our file on disk, and it has four pages. Right, one, two, three, four. And then in memory, in the operating system, we're going to have our virtual memory. So we mapped it in. So we have the four pages in memory. But at this point, at the very beginning, there's, no, there's nothing in there. Right? It's empty because we haven't gone to disk to get anything. And then we only have actually two pages of space in physical memory. So now if my process comes along and it wants to read the first page, I'll get a page fault, which is an interrupt. The operating system stalls my process uh, while it goes down to, to the disk fetches the, the page that I want, puts it in, in physical memory, and then maps the virtual memory to point to that physical page. Right? Again, if I access page three, same thing. I, I get a page fault. The OS stalls my, my process, and then it goes and fetches the, the, what I need. Right? The, the stalling the process essentially means that you're, you're blocking your thread, because you're, now you're down in the kernel, 
and the operating system knows not to have its scheduler schedule, schedule you for a quantum to actually run because you can't do anything because you're blocked waiting for, for this page. Right? Of course, now we have this problem of, well, we want to access this page here. It's not in memory. Uh, we don't have any more free space in physical memory. So what do we actually do? Right? We need to evict one uh, and, and make space for it. But now there might be other threads or other processes doing the same thing. Uh, so we may have a long stall. Right? So this is bad from our point of view. Remember I said earlier that ideally when we ever have to go to disk to get something, we don't want to stall the entire database system. We want to have something else keep running and maybe make forward progress on their queries while we go fetch the thing that we need. But in, in, in this case here with the operating system using MMAP, it doesn't do that because the, the, the operating system pro, uh, stalls our thread. Now if we have other threads, they can do other things, but that's going to cause problems. Right? So if we have multiple threads that access the same MMAP file at the same time to hide these page fault stalls, now we've got to deal with problems of what happens if they're reading and writing to different pages and how to make sure things actually get written out disk correctly. So I don't want to go into the details of how MMAP sucks. Uh, this has been a long-standing uh, beef that I have with MMAP, if you, if you want to call it that. I will say also underneath the covers, I mean, for, for if you call malloc, it's essentially doing MMAP, right? But it's not actually being backed by disk, right? It's just backed by just physical memory that's always there. Um, it could get swapped out, but that's that's the virtual memory in the OS. So MMAP works really great, or reasonably great for uh, read-only workloads. But when you have writers, then you have problems. So the way to sort of get handle this is that you, the OS does provide you some hints to overcome this, right? These three sys calls: m advise, m lock, m sync. Right, these are basically telling the operating system how you how the, your process, your database system is actually going to access the pages that you m mapped, right? So m advise can say that like I plan on reading these certain pages now, or how I, how I plan on reading them. M lock can tell the operating system whatever you do, don't swap this out to disk because I'm always going to do something to it. And then m sync allows you to, to to flush things. So there are some systems that actually use m map. Um, the ones that I'm aware of, in terms of full usage, would be MonadB and LMDB. The LMDB doesn't like me because I don't like MMAP. That's another story. Uh, and MonadB, MonadB is an analytical system that's highly read-only, so this is like fine. But when you actually want to start doing writes, that's when you have problems with MMAP. Now, there are some systems that also, that also use, uh, partially use uh, MMAP. So MongoDB, the original engine that actually, it actually uses, was based on MMAP. It was so bad that they threw it away. And actually built a, a sort of what I'll call a correct storage manager called Wire Tiger that does the things that we're talking about in this class. Um, MemSQL uses uh, MMAP for the column store for, for sort of read-only things. Same with the InfluxDB. And then SQLite has different engines you can use. And I think one of them is MMAP. So the bottom line I, I want to get out of this, and we'll see this later on when we talk about the buffer pool stuff, uh, the buffer pool manager in two lectures. But the reoccurring theme throughout this course also will be that the database management system can always do a better job than the operating system because it knows exactly what's happening. Right? It knows what the queries is executing. It knows what the data looks like. It knows how it's going to access that data. So therefore, it can always do a much better job at scheduling these things than, than the operating system. Right? Uh, and there's certain precautions you have to take to make sure that you write things out in the correct order, which are actually difficult to do and not really portable with the MMAP uh, syscall. So, if I die, uh, you can put two things on my tombstone. One is the operating system is not your friend. It's like a frenemy, right? You need it to survive, but like it kind of gets in the way. Um, and the second one is never use MMAP for your database management system, right? Now, I, I, I'll send an announcement of this, but this has been a long-standing beef. The, there's a, some, some really good researchers in Germany that try to use MMAP for their database system. They gave up on it. And we want to write a paper to prove that finally MMAP is a, is a bad idea for a database system. So if you're interested in this, and you want to you know, ruffle some feathers, email me, and we can talk about it. Um, all right, so again, we'll see this a couple of times throughout the semester where it seems like what I'm describing to you is functionality that the database system already can, or sorry, the operating system can already provide, but we're having to implement it ourselves. And every major commercial database system does this, right? Because they can always get a much better performance and have much better control and guarantee correctness and safety of data uh, in ways that may not always be possible with, with the operating system, right? So again, it's, what I'm describing throughout this class will seem like a lot of ways like, oh, it's like, almost like we're building a little mini operating system. Yes, but that's because we, we want to do things ourselves. And then you know what? If we go do this at a company, they pay us a lot to do it because it's hard, right? Which is always a good thing. 
All right, so what are the two problems we have to deal with database storage? So the first is that how are we going to actually represent the data in files on disk, right? And the second one is how are we actually going to manage this movement of memory back and forth, pages between the disk and memory back and forth. So for this class and the next class, we're going to focus on this problem here, right? So we're not going to worry about how we're actually, you know, if, if we have these pages and we copy the memory, what do we, how do we actually manage that? We'll cover that when we talk about the buffer pool stuff, and then that, that, that's what you'll do in the first project. We're really focused on this problem here of like, we have these files on disk, how do we actually, do, how do we actually represent the data that's stored in them? So for today's agenda, I'm going to talk about three parts. Right? And you can sort of see again what I said before, how we're going to build these layers up and do something more complicated things. So we're going to start with how we're actually going to maintain these files on disk. And then we'll build up from that and talk about how we actually organize the pages in those files. And then from that, we can then talk about how we actually organize the tuples inside of those pages. Right? So again, we'll go through these one by one and sort of see how these things build on top of each other. So in the most basic form, the database management system is essentially just going to store the database as files on disk. Right? There's no magic to it. There's just a bunch of files you have in your file system. Right? There they are. Uh, some systems will store uh, a single file. SQLite does this, right? If you, if you create a data, database in SQLite, it creates a single like, .db file for you, which is nice because it's, it's portable. You, you can move it around anywhere. Um, but typically, the, 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 the bigger systems actually store multiple files in, in various hierarchies, right? So if you have Postgres installed in your system, go in its Unix, go look at slash var, slash lib, slash uh, PostgresQL. They're going to have then all these directories where they'll have different directories for tables, different directories for indexes, different directories for, for metadata. And each inside of those will be these, these different uh, database files. So these files typically are in a proprietary format that is specific to the database minute system. So it's not like you can open up a text editor and actually see any data, right? It's going to be some binary form that only that database management system can read and write to. Now we'll see this one in the cloud systems later on, but there are sort of now these sort of universal file database file formats, things like ORC or Parquet or Aereo, right? These are things that are designed to be usable or ingestible by different database systems. But in, in general, usually the, the, the actual raw files themselves are, can only be, un, be understood by that, the database system that made it. So because they're just files on disk, the operating system doesn't know anything about them, right? Doesn't know that they're special, right? They doesn't know that they're database files. So all sort of the standard file protection mechanisms that you get from from regular files in the OS, that's, the OS will provide that, provide that for you as well. Right? You can just run your database system on top of ext4, ext3, you know, whatever Windows provides. Right? And the, the upper levels of the, of the system, for the most part, maybe don't care. I would say in the early 1980s, uh, there was a, for a, a, sort of a, a moment or a trend where the, the database vendors decided that all the file systems were crap and that they wanted to go actually implement their own database-specific file system. So what that means is like you just take the raw blocks on the actual storage device, and then the database system knew how to build a file system on top of that and just read and write to the, to the raw blocks. As far as I know, nobody actually does that anymore. I, for, certainly, you wouldn't build a new system today and start doing that. Um, there's conventional wisdom that you really only get maybe like a 10 or 15% speed up in performance if you run your own file system over something like ext4. Uh, and for that kind of speed up, it's just not worth the engineering effort, right? And also makes your makes your it makes your you know database system less portable. So in general, the the most major database systems are just going to run on existing file systems, and that, you know and that's good enough for us. It's not great, but it's good. So now this the the thing we first first need to build is what we will call the storage manager, and this is essentially responsible for the 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 maintaining of the database files, whether it's one or multiple ones. Uh, the storage manager is, is responsible for saying, here's, here's my files, and I know how to get pages in and out of them. So the files are going to be organized as a collection of pages. right? Where you sort of take the file and you split it up to, 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 to different chunks. And each of these chunks will be called a page. And so the storage manager keeps track of what data needs to read and write to pages, how much free space there is in pages. Uh, if you want to do compaction, maybe remove empty, empty pages that aren't being used and use less space. Right? This is what the storage manager provides for you. So now a database page, as I said, is a uh, fixed size block of data. And it can contain anything that, that relates to our, our database. Right? So it can contain tuples. It can contain metadata about the tuples. It can contain indexes. It can contain log records. 
It can contain intermediate results from a query as we're running it because we have to spill out the disks. We don't have enough memory. Right? For our purposes in this class, we'll just assume that we're only dealing with pages that contain tuples. Um, typically, you also don't mix the type of data you store in a page. So you're not going to have a single page that'll have some, you know, to have index data and uh, tuple data, right? From us, this is done mostly from a software engineering standpoint. You want to have each page only store data for of, of a of a specific class or specific type. Now, some systems actually require pages to actually be self-contained, and what I mean by that is all the data you need to know about how to read and, and interpret the data that's stored inside that page has to be stored in that page. So an example would this be, let's say I'm doing like dictionary comp compression, right? Dictionary compression is you take a string that, that occurs a lot, and instead of storing the actual raw characters, you just store an integer to say, here's, what, here's the, a placeholder for that original string. So you need a dictionary to say, here's how to map that integer to the actual original string. So if you store that dictionary on one page and then store the database that's encoded with that dictionary on another page, if that dictionary page gets trashed, right now you can't unencode anything in the original page. So some systems like Oracle, they, they're worried about disaster recovery. They actually say, oh no, the everything you need to know to actually interpret the data has to be on stored on that page. So that way, if for whatever reason that, that page gets trashed, the damage is only isolated to that single page. Right? So that is actually specific to Oracle. I don't think anybody else actually does this. Um, but I, I, I think it's actually a really good idea. But it, and it, it, it causes them to make certain other design decisions um, that may be seen inefficient from a performance standpoint, but from a you know never losing data, I think it's a it's a good idea. So now every page is going to have a unique identifier. We'll call it the page ID. Um, the now the data system is going to have to maintain some kind of indirection map that allows you to figure out how to take a page ID because that's what a, that's what the upper levels of the system are going to access or, or, or ask for. Right? The upper levels of the system is going to say, "Give me page one, two, three. And now the storage manager needs to have a, some kind of mapping layer to take that page number and find the file and the offset of where it can go get that particular page. And then put, give the bytes back up to whoever asked for it. So they also do, I think, say, the reason why we want to keep them fixed size is that that way in, in our file, if we say, oh, we want page 123, and we know it's in this file at, at offset 100, we know exactly how to calculate where to go in that, jump in that file to get the data that we need. If we have variable length pages, then we have to have an indirection layer at the top to say, oh, you want page 100, it's at this offset. And now you need to maintain that thing. And now you have other problems if you delete a page that may be variable size, now you have a hole that you maybe can't fill back up. So pages are always going to be fixed size, and this makes everything much easier. And we'll see how we do handle this with tuples that can be variable length within a page. So uh, one thing I, I, I'll confess is that as I go along, sometimes I'll say page, sometimes I'll say block. Right? They're, they're, the words are in some ways inter interchangeable, but I'll try to use pages as mu much as often. And there's different concepts of pages in our system that we have to be mindful of as well. So at the lowest point, you have what's called a hardware page. Right? This is what the actual storage device itself provides to you, right, to the operating system when you ask to read and write a particular block, a particular page. Right? Different storage devices have different page sizes, but in general, they're usually four kilobytes. And then now in the operating system, Again, it's going to be providing this notion of pages as well. And these pages are usually four kilobytes by default in Linux. Well, Linux and Windows are four kilobytes. But there's ways to turn, turn on what's called huge pages, where you can have it actually organize uh, memory as in, you know, up, I think up to one gigabyte pages. And you do this because this reduces the size of the page directory, your TLB, and that fits more in the cache, and you have fewer cache misses on that. But in our world, again, we care about the database page. And it's essentially, the way to think about this is like we're going to organize in our database the, uh, you know, our own pages, but then those pages will essentially get mapped to OS size pages, and the OS size pages get mapped to physical pages. Right? So you think it would be always four kilobytes, because that's what the hardware wants, and that's the OS wants, but in practice, it varies a lot. Right? So at one end of the spectrum, we have uh, SQLite that has one kilobyte pages, and this makes sense because they're, you know, SQL, SQLite is designed to run on really small embedded devices that may not have 4 kilobyte pages. Um, DB2 and Oracle support 4 kilobyte pages, Postgres and SQL Server are 8 kilobyte pages, and then MySQL in uncompressed form is 16 kilobyte pages. Um, I actually don't know why they do this. I have a hunch, because they want to do index organized tables, which I'll talk about later on. Um, but when you do compression, they also can store pages in, in smaller sizes as well. 
but we're not going to talk about it here. Um, what I'll say, though, is that the, the hardware page size is sort of what it can guarantee as what I call a fail-safe write, meaning it can guarantee that if you tell it to write four kilobyte pages and it says I wrote four kilobyte pages, right? That like, or you tell it to write a page and the page size is four kilobytes on the hardware, it'll guarantee that it, either all four kilobytes get written or none of them get written, right? So that means that if you have larger database pages and you need to flush them out the disk, you may have to do extra extra work or extra extra protection mechanisms to make sure that you don't have torn updates, right? If you have a sixteen kilobyte page in MySQL and the hardware can only provide four kilobyte atomic writes. You don't want to write the first, you know, eight kilobytes and then crash and come back and have you know, only half of your update. So we'll see this when we talk about logging recovery. Systems like MySQL have to do extra work to make sure that you know they're writing their data out uh, safely and they know it's been staged and all everything's always there. All right. So now we need if we if we have these these pages uh, and we know we have a bunch of files and they're, they're going to split up into pages. Now we need a mechanism to figure out how to actually find where the page that we want. Right? Again, the upper levels of the system are going to say, give me page one, two, three. And now we need to go figure out where that page one, two, three is. Or we want to, or, or the, the system could say, hey, I want to write this amount of data. Give me a page that has a free slot. And now our, our storage layer has to figure out how to, how to find that. So there's a couple of different ways to actually do this. I'm going to focus on the first one um, because this is the most common. The sequential and sorted file organization uh, We'll see this when we talk about indexes. This is typically how you implement clustering indexes, right? Well, basically, the heap file is unsorted. Sequential or sorted files are sorted, and you need an index to make that happen. And we'll talk about that later. And then hashing file organization is just an easy extension to the heap file one. So we'll focus on, on the first one. The other thing I'll say also at this point is that we don't really care what's inside of our pages at this point. Again, we're only trying to say, give me a page or give me a free slot within a page. We don't care what's actually stored in that. Right, and that makes this our job a bit more easier here because we don't care about finding exact, you know, exact things. We can let the upper levels of the system do that for us. So a database heap um, or a, a heap file is a unorganized collection of pages where the tuples can be stored in random order, or the data that we're storing can be stored in random order. Right? We have a chunk of data we want to write to a page. We don't care if it's we're using a heap file. We don't care where that actually goes as long as it just goes somewhere. So the basic API we need to be able to support in a heap file or a database heap uh, uh, storage manager is the ability to get and delete a page uh, as well as to uh, iterate over every possible page. Right? So I, if I have 100 pages, I want a way to say, here's, here, you know, here's the, 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 the chunks of memory that for each of those 100 pages. Now, we're going to need to maintain some metadata to keep track of what pages exist, obviously. And we need to keep track of where do we have uh, free space. Because again, we may want to say, get a page that has a free space that we, that we can store th this amount of data in. So now there's two ways to organize this. The first is a linked list, and the, and the second one is a page directory. And sort of the spoiler is everyone does uh, the page directory approach. But it's good to understand what the linked list one is, because it, it sort of see why you need to use a page directory. So the linked list approach is you have a single header page that only contains two pointers. And the pointer is going to point to two different linked lists. So the first linked list will be the free page list. So these are pages that have at least some free space where you can actually store data. Um, and then the second linked list is the data page. These are pages there that there are there is no more free space. right? So what will happen is if you want to say, get me page one, two, three, you actually have to traverse these linked lists and figure out where the page it is that you want. Or if you need to say, I want to insert a new record and I need to find space, you only have to, you only have to follow along the, the free page list. All right? And this is because there's additional metadata that we need that we're not actually going to track inside of the, the header page right? about like wh what free space we actually have. All of that's going to be stored directly inside the pages themselves. All right? There's no reason we couldn't. It's just for, this is sort of a straw man implementation where, where we don't actually do this. Right. The other thing we have problem is that say we want to get page one, two, three, we end up having to do basically a sequential scan on both of these until we find the one that, that we want. Right. So the better approach, and what everyone, pretty much everyone does, is to use the page directory. Where this is now, you're going to have a special directory page. It's usually at the beginning of the file. So SQLite, the first page is always this directory, 
and it just tells you, here's all the pages that I have at diff different locations in my database files, and here's information about how, many, how much free space they actually have. So now you can easily traverse every single page because you just look in the directory, and you, say you want to get page one, two, three, again, you look in the directory, it tells you exactly where it is, and you want to find a page with free space, again, the directory can, can maintain this as, for as well. So of course now you have to make sure that uh, the directory page is always in sync with the actual data pages themselves, right? Because if, if the data page has free space and the directory page thinks it doesn't, then you're never actually going to use that space, right? So you always have to make sure that you, you flush out the directory page anytime you, you add new pages or modify these things. So what would happen in this case here if the, the directory page gets trashed? Are we screwed? You shake your head no. Why? Exactly. So if the first page gets, gets blown away for whatever reason, right, we can always go back and scan through and look at every single page and reconstruct it. Right? Small files, no big deal. If I have a one petabyte database, that's, that's a problem, right? Because it's going to take me days to actually do this. So there's extra protection mechanisms we can have in our system by writing out to the log all the updates we have to our, our directory page to avoid having to recreate everything. All right, so this, this approach is resilient to failures even if the directory page fails. Even though, again, remember I said that some systems don't like to have uh, data that you need to reconstruct you know, for a single page spread across multiple pages. In this case here, we can always make sure, we can always go back and, and recreate the directory page. Ideally, it'd be nice if we didn't have to, um, but we always have that sort of uh, failback mechanism. OK, so at this point, we know about files. We know about how we're going to split the files up into pages, and then now we have a directory, page directory uh, uh, component that allows us to find the pages that we want. So now the next question is, how do we, what, how do we actually organize the data inside of these pages? And this is what the page layout is. So every page is going to contain a header, right, regardless of what size it is. And this header is going to contain metadata about the, that particular page, right? Things like how much free space there is. Uh, you can also maintain checksums, right? So when you write out the file, you take a checksum of it, and that way, or sorry, write out the page, take a checksum of it when you write it out, and that way when you read it back in, if the page sum, the checksum doesn't match, you know the page got corrupted in some way. You also, you also want to maintain the, the, the version number of the data center system that created the, the page, so that way if you change your page layout and you load in an old database file, you know it's not, you know, you know what layout you, to expect. Um, We'll talk about this later on for concurrent control information, but sometimes you can you contain transaction visibility information about the data that's on this page so that you know whether a transaction that's active is actually could be able to see any of the tuples or any of the data that's inside this page. Um, it's compression information like the dictionary encoding that we talked about before. Right? So all this is going to be stored in the header. And as I mentioned, some systems will actually require the pages to be uh, self-contained. So now within a page, right, every page has a header. Now we want to talk about what actually the, the data block looks like. What, what are we actually storing? So for this, we're, all, we're just going to focus on tuples. Um, we'll see this later on when we talk about indexes or other things or log records. Right, these are also going to be stored in pages. But for our purposes here, we just care about how we're actually going to represent tuples inside of these pages. So for this, there's essentially two, two broad approaches. The first is a tuple-oriented approach. Uh, we're actually storing the data for actually individual tuples. And the second one is a log structured approach. I'll, I'll, I'll go through both of them. All right, so how are we going to store pages in a tuple? So I first want to propose a straw man, like a bad idea, uh, and then we'll see how actually how to make this better, right? So let's say that in our page, all we really have in, in, our, in our header, the simple thing we need to keep track of is the number of tuples that we have in, in, our, in our page. And for this, we're going to assume that all our tuples are fixed length size. I mean, they're always going to be, you know, 100, 100 bytes or, or, you know, some, some, some number like that, right? So what's the easiest thing we can do to insert a new tuple in this? Sequential, I heard it, yeah. So I want to insert a bunch of new tuples. I just, I know where my header stops in, in my page, and I just, I just start appending tuples one by one until, you know, until I run out of space, right? Simple. And then let's say, uh, and then I update my, my header to say I have three tuples. So that way when I come back, if I want to write a fourth tuple, I know how to jump to th that location. All right, what's the problem with this approach? All right, what happens if, if, I, if I delete a tuple? Right, I delete the middle guy here. I have two tuples. 
Now if I keep appending, right, I'm going to miss that. So maybe what I need to do is actually oh, to start from the beginning and keep scanning until I find a tuple, that, a tuple slot that, that's actually used, right? What's another obvious problem with this? Right, I said it was fixed length, right? What happens if it's variable length? Does this work? No, right. So how, how would I actually store variable length data in this? If I if say I want to search the next tuple, how do I figure out where to, where to put it? I either have something in the, in the, in the header that says, here's where, every tuple, here's where the offset every tuple is, or I sequentially scan to I find a free spot, then have to figure out when the next tuple starts, because I have to then figure out where I, I can start storing data. All right? So this is what the slotted page architecture or layout fix, fixes. So what I'll say is that slotted pages are essentially how every disk database system, uh, pretty much the majority of them actually are implemented. The exact details may be slightly different, but at a high level, they work all the same way. So what's going to happen now is our header. Uh, we're going to have this thing called a slot array. Right, so we have our header information, the, the things we talked about before. Now we have the slot array that's going to contain a, a mapping of all sets for tuples at different positions to their, their starting location uh, in, in the actual data space. And so down below, we have our fixed length and variable length tuples all stored in line with each other. Um, and then these, these offsets point to where they start. All right, so this is sort of adding another indirection layer inside of our page. So we can say things like, at a high level, give me page one, two, three, and give me tuple five in that, inside that page. And I go look at my slot array, and that'll tell me where I can find page five. Right? And the way we're going to add new tuples is that the slot array is always going to grow from, from beginning to the end. And then the fixed length, the actual data of the tuples themselves, are going to grow from the end to the beginning. And at some point, the two meet, and I can't store anything, anything else. And then the page is considered full. Right? Again, there's another indirection layer that allows us to reorganize the pages without having to modify or change anything up above in our system. So maybe the case, let's say I delete uh, tuple three, and now I have a bunch of free space here, and I can actually compact and slide over tuple four to be contiguous with tuple two, and all I do is update my slot array to say where tuple four now starts, and everything else in the system doesn't know, doesn't care. Right? It's sort of like doing compaction in the page level as you write it out the disk. So as I said, this is the most common approach. How they actually organize the slot array could be slightly different. What, what additional metadata they store for the slot array could be different. But at a high level, everybody wor works like this. So another different architecture, instead of storing actually tuples in pages, is to do what's called a log-structured uh, page layout, a log-structured organization. So last year, I presented this in the same, the same material here in the same lecture, but just in a different part. I, I, I'm never quite sure when actually to, to, to discuss log-structured uh, files or log-structured page layouts um, because it's, sort of, it's a combination of a, of a bunch of different things. I think this is the right point, uh, but we'll see how it goes. Um, the, the way to sort of think about these log-structured file organization is that instead of actually storing tuples inside of pages, we're going to store log records. So we haven't discussed what logging actually is, but basically think about it's like a, um, you know, it's like a record of the changes that you made to the database. So if I updated Andy's tuple, I made my salary go from $1 to $2, I would have a log record that says update Andy's tuple from $1 to $2. And I can always replay that log and recreate the actual data itself. So in a log structured database system, you actually don't store any tuples at all. You only store the log records of the changes that transactions or trans changes that queries make. Right, so now in a single page, what I'm going to have is I'm just going to keep appending log entries from beginning to end that correspond to the changes that, that, that the query has made. And sort of think of this as going in contiguously in time. Right? I never go back and I delete any log record inside a page, so I'm never going to have any holes. Right? And these can be variable length because my updates can have variable length data. But I just keep appending into my page until I run out of space, and then, then the page is considered full. Right? So these log records will contain things. If I do an insert, it just contains the entire tuple. If I do a delete, I have some way to mark that the tuple got deleted. And if I do an update, it's just the delta of the change that got ma that made, right? So what's the tricky thing about log structured pages? What's slower? Reconstructing a tuple. 
Exactly. Read. Reads are slower, right? Updates are easy. Just I find a page that has a free slot, and boom, I append it to the end. I'm done. If I'm doing a read, now I need to go back potentially and look through the page and reconstruct the, the tuple into its original form based on its log records. So to do reads, I, I have to go in reverse order, right? So, so that I mean, so that so, so that's a problem. And so now again, this is within the context of a single page, but you know, in a, in a real log structure file system, these are you know, our log structure database. These are strewn across multiple pages. So I made to go need read through multiple pages in order to reconstruct the tuple back to the form that I need for the read. So the way to avoid having to read everything is that you can build indexes up above. And basically, say you know, if you need tuple ID one two three, here's where to go get it right at these different locations. Um, so log structured systems are, are log structured databases are not new. They can't go date back to the 19, late 1980s, early 1990s, but they're actually really in vogue now. There's a much more systems that actually implement this. Um, things like LevelDB, RocksDB, Cassandra, HBase, and this is partly because they're running on, on things like HDFS, which are append only file systems or append only storage. Right? So you can only write blocks in HDFS. You can't go back and update things. And that works perfectly for a log structure system like this. So the second problem we're going to have, in addition to actually maybe reading a lot, of, or to avoid the problem of having to read everything, we can try to be clever and maybe do compaction and recognize that instead of having to replay the log every single, for every single log record, we can take a chunk of it and compress it back down to just the, the, the single records that correspond to the changes that actually got made. Right, so if I update my salary, go from one dollar to two dollar, and then the next day I need to get another raise and go from two dollars to three dollars. Instead of having to read those two log records, I can just compress that down or compact that down into a single log record, and now reads are much faster. Right, and again, uh, you know, these are the systems that are actually using this. So, what's the problem with compaction? So now, for every single time I do a write, I append my log record. And then at some later point, I may compact these, these pages or compact the log records in my semi page, and I'm writing it out again. Right? So this is called write amplification. If I do a write to a record, uh, you know, my transaction committed, my query's done, I did my write, it's in my database. But in the background, I may do, be doing compaction and rewriting that same log record over and over again. Right? In the tuple oriented pages that I talked about, for the most part, if I write to my page, I write to my tuple, it's done. Right? Once it's on disk, I'm never going to go back and, and maybe write it out again. Right? D different systems do different things, but in general, that's the case. So with compaction, the problem is that we end, up, you know, we end up writing out the same record over and over again, and we amplify the amount of writes we do it. And if you're using SSDs that have a limited number of white writes before they wear down the cells, you, know, you could burn this out you know, in, in, in a year, or burn out a device in a year, depending on how, uh, how many writes it supports. So there's different levels of compaction, or different, sorry, different types of compaction you can do. Um, I want to talk about two methods that are used in RocksDB. So you might have heard of LevelDB from Google. LevelDB is an MMAP database that does log structured, uh, uh, log structured storage. Facebook got a hold of it, renamed it to RocksDB, got rid of MMAP, and then made it much, much better. So if you want a log structured uh, embedded database, you want to use RocksDB, not LevelDB. And so RocksDB supports two types of compaction. The first is called level compaction. Uh, where the basic idea is that all your writes first end up in these sort of log files, um, and then at some point in the first level, when you write, say, to a cert certain number of files, you want to compact them and combine them into a, a single larger sort of log, log file and put that into the next level. And you keep doing this, you keep doing this in the, in the first level, right? You, you keep making log records, and they get too big, you move them down to the second level, and at some point, the second level gets too big. And then you move them down into giant files in the in the next level. And this is what I was mean by write amplification. Right, I can do a single write into level zero, but then as I do compaction at the different levels, I, I end up writing that thing out over and over again because I'm going to read it from one one page, combine it with another page, and write it back out. The other type of compaction you can do universal compaction, where there's sort of where there's a single level, and basically what you do you just take two uh, different pages that are contiguous to each other in space, and then you combine them to a single, single, uh, single, page, uh, single file like this. So we can talk about more about RocksDB and LevelDB maybe next class, but at a high level, this is, this is what they're doing. They're log-structured page layouts, and those upper levels of the systems know how to replay the log records to put the, data, to put the, page, the tuples back in the correct form. All right, so the last thing I want to talk about is the tuple layout. 
So again, we have files, files have pages, and within those pages we can organize our data uh, that can, can contain tuples or contain log records. Now we want to understand what these actual tuples look like. So a tuple in our world is essentially a sequence of bytes. Right? It's, it's, it's all we're really doing. And it's the upper levels of the systems that know how to then break those bytes up into attributes with the different types and expose them in a, in a more programmatic way to the, to the application. So it's essentially the job of the database management system to be able to interpret those bytes, interpret those values uh, in the manner that, the, that the, the programmer described or defined for, the, for that table. So now, within every single page, we're going to have tuples. Again, this is, this is assuming we're doing a tuple-oriented page layout, not the log structure stuff. But every tuple is going to have a header. And the header is going to contain metadata about the tuple itself. Right? So it can contain more visibility information about what transactions read and wrote to that, that tuple. Um, it contains a bitmap for which attributes uh, are, are considered null. Um, it usually doesn't contain anything about what the data actually looks like, meaning we're not going to store any metadata about the schema of the tuple. All that is sort of handled separately by other parts of the system. Right, so that means we don't have to be redundantly stored the same information about every single tuple over and over again. Right, so it sort of looks like this. Right, you have a uh, you have a byte array for your tuple. You have your header, and then you're going to have a uh, contiguous list of of attributes that are stored just as, as a byte array. Right. So typically, what happens is in most database systems, however you define the 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 ordering of the columns when you call when you call create table. That's how it's going to be written out to, to disk, right? So inside the page, if I have my five attributes, A, B, C, D, E, I will have eight attributes A, B, C, D, E lined up in that order inside the tuple itself. Now, there's nothing about the relational model that says you have to do that, right? That's the beauty of, of the abstraction between the logical and physical. So at the physical layer, we can reorganize these, these, these any way we want. Uh, and at the logical layer, you would still see them in, always in the correct order. Now. As far as I know, in disk-based systems, uh, except for the, the column store stuff, which we'll talk about next class, pretty much everyone always writes the data out in the order that you define it. And that's just done for sort of simplicity reasons. In the advanced class, we'll talk about in-memory databases, where you actually do want to reorganize how, how you lay out data in memory, because that, that matters for getting uh, word alignment with cache lines. And it, you can get much better performance that way. But on disk, again, we said we're just reading four kilobyte pages from disk. You know, the alignment of what's inside those pages actually doesn't matter. Right? That's always going to be the main bottleneck. The other thing we can do also with, with, with tuples is instead of just storing all the data for a single, uh, single table inside of a tuple, we actually can combine data from other tables inside of our tuples inside of our own page. So typically, every page will have, uh, a, if you're doing tuple storage, every page will only contain data for one table. So if I have table foo, then there'll be pages for table foo. But there's another technique you can do to actually combine data from different tables inside of a single page to help you possibly speed up performance. So this is called uh, uh, denorm denormalization. So I didn't do a lecture on normal forms and functional dependencies this year because uh, it's, it's really long and people always hate it. People start, their eyes start bleeding because it's boring. Um, the only thing you really need to know about normal forms is that they exist in the textbook, but nobody actually does it in the real world. Um, the way to sort of think about it at a high level is it's a way to combine tables or break tables apart. And you sort of get this naturally if you have foreign key dependencies, right? Remember I talked about artists and, and albums, right? You could combine that into a single table, but then you're duplicating everything. So the, the normal forms to say actually split them up so that you have you know, single records for, for albums and single records for artists. Right? That's the gist of normal forms you all, you, that you really need to know. So with denormalization, it's, it's, instead of splitting it apart, it's putting it back together. So the user can define our tables in a pro the proper normal form with separate, you know, separate tables. But underneath the covers inside of our pages, we actually can combine these things to get better performance. And again, it's completely transparent to the actual application. So I have two tables here. I have foo and bar. And bar has a foreign key dependency on attribute A. So again, if I'm just storing these things as uh, every page has its own tuples, then I would have a tuple for, for foo in one page, and then the tuples for bar in another page. So physical denormalization is essentially like doing a pre-join. So I know there's a foreign key dependency between these two tuples, so I'm likely to join them together all the time in queries. 
So what I can instead do is actually inline all the values for the, the bar table that relate to uh, this particular tuple inside that, that tuple. So inside the tuple, I have my attributes A, B, C, A, sorry, A, B, but then I'm going to have this list of all the attributes C that correspond to the bar table. So now when I, when I want, run, a run, these, run a query, uh, I know how to, sorry, I know, how to I know what portion of the tuple belongs to foo, and I know what tuple belongs to bar, and depending on what the query wants, I may actually read one or the other. Right? So again, this speeds up joins, because now instead of having to go get one page fetch for foo, one page fetch for bar, if I'm joining them together on the foreign key, it's one page fetch to go get all the data that I need. So, I will say that uh, or this, this, this makes the read queries potentially faster, but it can make updates more expensive, because if I run out of space for putting attributes to C in, then I need to reorganize my pages. So as in all cases in databases, what seems like a cool idea or a new idea is not new. Uh, and it's almost like that South Park episode where they always say the Simpsons did it, right? So in databases, it's always IBM did it. So IBM did this way back in 1970s with System R, which is the first relational database that they built. Uh, it turned out to be really difficult to maintain, and they abandoned the idea when they went off and built DB2, right? As I said, doing updates is, becomes more expensive because you have to reorganize things. But now, 30, 40 years later, now a bunch of companies are actually trying to do this because it makes joins go faster. So Google does this in Spanner for storing protocol buffer data, right? They actually inline the, 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 dependence, the dependent uh, values for one sort of table inside of another table. So again, you reduce the number of page fetches you have to go get. There was a startup called Akiban uh, from about 10 years ago that was doing this for MySQL. Uh, they got bought up by FoundationDB, which then got bought up by Apple. Um, as far as I know, they, they ended up abandoning this. This technique actually looks a lot also to a lot like what the JSON or document databases like RethinkDB or MongoDB or Couch, Couchbase, how they work, right? Because you don't really define tables, you define these JSON documents, and you can pre-join related table or related information inside that document, right? So that you don't have to do separate fetches to go get this. At a high level, this is the same thing as physical denormalization. So it's the same technique that IBM did in, in the 1970s. All right, we have a few minutes left. Uh, so I want to talk about one last thing, is how we're going to keep track of what, what our tuples are. Right. right? So again, we, I ever said every page has a page ID, and there's a page directory that says, if you want page one, two, three, there's some directory information that says where to go get it. Now for tuples, we'll talk about indexes to go find them later on, but internally, uh, different data systems could represent actual, you know, individual tuples in different ways. And these are usually called record IDs. So the most common approach for a record ID is that it will be the page ID plus an offset or a slot inside that page. Right? Remember I said if I want page one, two, three and give me the, the fifth tuple, I know that I'll go find that page and I look at my slot array and that tells me where to jump inside the page to find that individual tuple. So some systems actually expose the information to you at the application level. So in Postgres, it's called the CTID, and they store this as four, four bytes. In SQLite, they store this as a row ID, which is eight bytes, and then Oracle store, has their own row ID that stores this in 10 bytes. Um, the reason why the Oracle one is bigger is because they are storing additional metadata information about you know, what table, what file this, the, the tuple action came from. Um, but in practice, it's, it's sort of like this logical number or, uh, th that you're not really supposed to use in your application because it can change at any time. So I want to give a quick demo of this so you can actually see them. Um, right, so this one we're going to do Postgres at the top and, um, and uh, SQLite at the bottom. So I have two tables. I'm sorry, I have one table. I just made a, a simple table called R, right? So Postgres at the top has three tuples, 101, 102, 103, and same thing as SQLite at the bottom. So as I said, Postgres is going to store what's called the CTID. Um, and again, this is, this, is, this is an internal thing that you're not really supposed to use in your application because it can change at any time. So inside my query here, I can say r.ctid, and Postgres knows that I'm referring to its internal identifier. And you can see that it represents this as, as a pair of two numbers, right? The first number is the page, the, the second number is the offset in that page, right? So now let's say if I do a, uh, if I do a delete, 
I go back, right, and it's gone. And you know, the the, th the what used to be the third tuple is 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 still at position zero zero three because it didn't reorganize things, right? And let's say now I insert another tuple. I do my read again, and then you see Postgres decided to rather than using position two, uh, where the, the the two bytes deleted was stored, it put it in the fourth position. Right, so it's appending it to the, the end of the slot array. So we won't talk about the vacuum just now, but the vac you think of the vacuum as doing like garbage collection in, in the JVM. Right? It's going to go through and reorganize every page and compact them to free up any space that's not being used anymore. So now when I go back and look at my table again, remember I had 0, 01, 0, 03, 0, 04. Right? Now I have 0, 01, 0, 02, 0, 03. Because it reorganizes the, 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 the layout of the, of the tuples inside the slotted page, and then wrote that back out the disk. And now my CTIDs are different. All right. So last year, somebody had a question whether I can do this. Can I actually go to the table and say, uh, where CTID equals something? And Postgres is amazing. And it lets you do it. All right. But you're not supposed to do this, right? You're not supposed to use the CTID in any way in your application form because, as I showed, it can change at any time, right? So in SQLite, down below, uh, SQLite instead of CTID, they call it uh, row ID, right? And you can see it's just storing it as, as one, two, three here, right? So it's not a, it's not like the page ID in offset. It's just this internal sequence that Postgres maintains. So now if I do a delete, right, go back, uh, the, the second guy's gone, and I do a new, new insert, and it didn't, it didn't fill in the slot, it just used, you know, depending to the end, right? Again, I think in, actually in SQLite, I don't know whether they guarantee that, I think, actually, I think in SQLite they guarantee that this is always, uh, always be, um, always increasing. And they always uh, stay with the tuple. But let's see. So if I delete every single tuple, right? There's nothing there. Now I go insert back that same tuple. No, oh, I started off with one. Okay. So yeah, still don't want to use it because it could could change. Right? Yes. So the garbage collection has to be done manually. So his question is in the case of Postgres. All right, so, um, it's this thing called the vacuum. His question is, does this have to be done manually? Newer versions of Postgres, do not, you do not have to do this manually. This will, we'll cover this when we talk about multi-version concurrency control. Basically, what Postgres is doing is, any single time you update a tuple, it doesn't actually overwrite the existing tuple. It makes a new one. And it maintains an internal list, an internal like, linked list to say, here's, go, here's how to go get the, the version of the tuple that you, that you want. Right? So if I go back here, and so the vacuum is a way to go and prune out the, the older version that no one can see anymore. So we see that again. So if I go here, I have three tuples. So I'd say I do update, uh, update r set val equal y by y, where id equals one of three. Actually, let me, let me do this first before I do that. Let's go see what the CTID is. So there's our CTIDs. So now I'll, I'll run that query, right? So we're going to update the, the 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 second tuple. I do my update. Mm, is that correct? Yeah, and and then it, it took the it took the actually this is a good example of like how the relational model is different. So before the update, when I did a select, it put the second tuple in the second position. After my update, it now became the third tuple, right? Because again, the relational model is, is unordered. So what happened was I did my update and I appended the new change for this tuple that was here, now at 0, 02, now at 0, 04. So now as I'm doing my scan, I'm just reading them in, based on the offsets. So the tuple in the last offset ends up showing up as the last one in my, my output. right? Because again, the, the relational model isn't organized. Right? There's, no, there's no notion of ordering in this case here. Right, so same thing. I mean, the point I wanted to make here is that it was at position zero two after the update as now as zero four. In the background, Postgres knows that it has to run the vacuum 
Uh, I think it runs it. It's a combination of either uh, I've changed the table so much, or I'm running out of space, or it's it's uh, uh, different periods, right? Again, this is what a database administrator could do for you. If, if the vacuum can be expensive operation because they're essentially reading everything, you, every page that, that has got changed since the last time you ran the vacuum, which means reading them in, reorganizing them, and running them back out. You maybe not want to do that during the day because you're trying to you know keep up with the workload. So maybe you want to do less vacuuming during the day, more vacuuming at night. All right, this is something that the, the administrator can control. All right, any questions about row IDs? So the some of them will actually store them directly in the tuple. Right, I think uh, SQLite's doing this. Uh, and Oracle does this. Other systems like Postgres don't actually store the, the record ID or the row ID in the tuple itself, right? Because it's a waste of space. Right, but you can derive that based on the page ID and offset. All right, so what did we cover today? We covered how to organize the database in pages. We covered how to actually track those pages so that when upper levels on the system, system says, give me a particular page, it knows how to go find that. Uh, we did, talked about different ways to actually store those pages. Um, we talked about how to actually organize the tuples inside of those pages, right? So next class, what we'll talk about is sort of more, more complicated things that don't deviate from what we've talked about here, but it's sort of, again, building upon uh, what we've done. So we'll talk about how actually how do you actually imp, uh, represent the values inside of the tuples themselves, right, going even further inside of the page. And then we'll talk about different storage models. So a storage model is a way to actually organize the data within a table. And so the, what I'll say is everything I've showed here today is called a row store, meaning like the for every single tuple, it's sort of organized in, contiguously across all the attributes. Like one tuple doesn't begin until the next one finishes. Another way to do this is actually organize these things as columns, where all the values for a single column across multiple tuples are stored contiguously, right? And again, the page layout stuff doesn't change. Uh, so the, the, the way we're organizing our pages with directories doesn't change. It's just how we're actually representing the data inside those pages changes. OK? <laughs> That's my favorite all time. Uh, <laughs> what is it? Yes! It's the SD Cricket IDES. I make a mess unless I can do it like a geo. Ice Cube with the G to the E to the T. Now here comes, dude. I play the game where there's no rules. The homies on the cup say so I'm a fool cause I drink brew. Quick the bust a cap on the eyes, bro. Bushwick on the go with a flow to the eyes, show. Here I come. Willie D, that's me. Rolling with fifth one, South Park and South Central G. And St. Eyes when I party. By the 12 pack case of the 40. A six pack 48 gets the real pounce. I drink fruit, but yo, I drink it by the 12 ounce. They say beer makes you fat. But St. Isaac's straight, so it really don't matter. <laughs>